day of mass excitement on the French island of Corsica 30 years ago. Celebrations already in the streets as the northern club of Bastia prepared to host the footballing giants Marseille in the 1992 French Cup semi-final. The preparations were in place. The Furiani Stadium, proud to have doubled its capacity to 18,000 by the construction of a huge temporary stand. Thousands of people packed in, waiting for one of the island's biggest sporting moments. Already, though, there was worry as people began to spot structural problems with the stand, parts becoming loose. <laughs> At that moment, it was pulled down to the ground and it all went black. Hundreds of people fell dozens of metres to the ground in a tangle of metal, many crushed in the collapse, others in the mayhem that followed. The pitch soon transformed into a makeshift hospital. In all, 19 people lost their lives and more than 2,300 were injured. It was, and in fact still is, the worst sporting disaster in French history. The case went to court two and a half years later. Those involved sentenced to up to two and a half years in jail, although most were later reduced or suspended. But 30 years on, what have those caught up in what happened? Have the scars healed? And what has been done to ensure such an accident could never happen again? Well, Annabelle Lecouf Robaglia with Flori Castan and Thierry de Rue revisit Furiani for France 24. <laughs> Wounds of the past heal. They heal slowly and leave scars. It wasn't easy. And the pain that could have consumed us all turned out to be a great power. At the time of the tragedy, the number of victims amounted to 1% of the island's population. Each Corsican family had a relative, a friend, or an acquaintance that was affected by the catastrophe. 30 years ago, the sun was going down and there was a good atmosphere. We were all used to looking at our family to wave at them, but then we saw the stand falling. It looked like a Mexican wave, but we didn't see the crowd stand back up. A little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, that's the start, that's when it all broke, and I fell straight down. I had this feeling of being sucked into the ground, and then nothing, a black void. I might have been unconscious for two seconds, and then the shock woke me up. We saw people being skewered. There were two of them. I was in between them who unfortunately died. I was astounded by the number of injured that were already there. There were people everywhere, lying down, hurt. We didn't really know what was wrong. The medical staff were obviously overwhelmed. Paul Kalassi was among the most severely injured. Internal hemorrhaging, fractured vertebrae. He saw his life changed at 43. The physiotherapist would come and say, bend the right leg, bend the left leg. In my head, my legs were bending. I did not know about the paralysis, and I found out when I had made it to the rehabilitation center. Paul Kalassi had to start learning everyday gestures again. In 1992, he was working in catering, an activity he chose and loved, a profession that has since become impossible for him to practice. I would have loved to keep myself busy, not physically, but able to deal with business. I would have loved it, first because it would have given me something to do, because, well, you wake up in the morning without any purpose. There is nothing to do, and it's nothing like paid leave. It's all year round, and it's long.
Despite his disability, Paul kept going out and having a social life. But in the last decade, his condition slowly deteriorated. Due to multiple setbacks following the stadium collapse, he had to get his right leg amputated. It's quite hard to move. So you don't move. You don't strain. You don't tire yourself out. Just like Paul, the other victims had their lives and bodies shattered. Beyond the obvious physical injuries, some suffered from wounds that are invisible, but just as crippling. Didier Grassi was a journalist at the time. He was with his colleagues at the press area and was seriously injured. He suffered for a long time from post-traumatic stress, which was not a common term 30 years ago. His meeting with the psychiatrist, Richard Reckman, allowed him to finally talk about his psychological scars. I came to see you at the end of a conference to ask you about, what is it called? Survivor trauma? Right, survivor syndrome. You told me about how you struggled with that and how hard it was for others to talk about it. It reminded me of this typical survivor syndrome, which is basically, I'm not going to tell you about my suffering because of the others. Why did I survive, but the others didn't? That's it, guilt. Somehow I felt like, yeah, I did not understand why I, amongst others, made it, and why I was still alive, while only a few centimeters away from me, on my right, on my left, I knew people who had lost their lives. When Didier told me about the suffering he'd been going through for a number of years, I immediately recognized what we call the survivor syndrome, this guilt that takes root in the memory of those who survived such a tragic event and that saw people around them who didn't make it. Many of the victims developed this kind of trauma, but they never received any treatment, help or support. Now, because of what happened in Furiani, this type of trauma is recognized. Since Furiani, and that was the trigger, there are systematically medical and psychological emergency units in this sort of situation. And while medical and surgical care is provided, so is psychological care to all the people involved. That's why in 1995, when the terror attack in the Paris metro occurred, an emergency response was immediately put into place to take care of the victims that were psychologically scarred. This procedure later became commonplace. Ismail Triki was the former Bastia Sporting Club's defender. He's now a junior football club trainer. Some of the children he coaches had a parent or relative attending the game on the day of the tragedy. After the chaos, everyone tried to help as much as they could. Ismail saw a child with a severe leg injury and protected him with a raincoat. I was constantly looking for the person I'd given this raincoat to. And one day, coincidentally, at a birthday, he was recounting his experience of the disaster because he knew I was a football player. I was listening to his story and I told him, but I gave my raincoat to a kid who had a broken leg. You had something, you didn't want to leave. He nodded and I said, it's you then. And he said, yes, it's me. Following the catastrophe, a group was created. Its goal was to provide help to the victims by achieving justice, obtaining compensation, and getting their status recognized. Josefa Guidicelli is the president of this victims group. She lost her father in the tragedy, and she is fighting to ensure the victims are remembered. To this day, she denounces what led to the tragedy. It's outrageous how, within a few days only, they managed to tear down the old stadium and to double or triple the number of seats to make money. Because we have to say it how it is. We need to remind people that the Furiani disaster is entirely due to greed. 
The stand was built hastily in violation of the most basic security rules. And profit for the Bastien Club seems to have taken priority over audience safety. Jean Prunetta has been a sports journalist for RCFM for more than 30 years. Throughout his long career, he has witnessed key changes made to the way people attending public events have been accommodated. Fortunately, there hasn't been a stadium like that since. Since uh, Furiani, a law prohibiting the construction of tribunes that large was passed. That is because a peak had been reached with 10,000 people sat on boards and metal scaffolding. Thirty years after the tragedy, Josefa Guidicelli and the members of the Victims Group organized a week of commemorations. For both survivors and witnesses, it's an opportunity to stress the disaster has been somehow forgotten by the continent. The Furiani disaster did not have the national dimension it should have had. So events like this never happen again. We don't go and watch a match and die there. So we don't end up disabled there, live our lives bedridden, hurt, destroyed. For some people, Furiani has been going on for 30 years. They relive it every single day. To mark this ill-fated semi-final, a commemorative football match took place between former players from the Marseille and Bastia teams. They came from all over Europe for what is obviously a symbolic match and a terribly important one for the collective psyche in Corsica. They really experienced it firsthand in Furiani. Football players became paramedics. It was all hands on deck. We, the football players, pulled down the fence so people could get out. We had to tell people to jump. We didn't know what was about to happen. Maybe it was going to fall down as well. So we had this reflex to open the fence and let the people that were inside the stadium onto the pitch. Since Furiani, there are no longer any shoddy stands, and the victim's psychological trauma is being addressed. But there was still one matter to be dealt with for the population of Corsica. They wanted the 5th of May to be marked within the football community. Si de mon côté, j'ai été frappé. Uh... I suffered from trauma-induced amnesia, but I feel like football authorities, while they weren't traumatized, they suffered from their own amnesia since they overlooked the tragedy because they kept playing football on the 5th of May. And even when there was no football match on the 5th of May, on that day there was no reference to the disaster, no minute of silence, no tribute, etc. Faced with what it felt was indifference toward the 19 people who lost their lives and those injured, the victims group worked to ban professional matches on the anniversary of the tragedy. We tried to get in touch with football authorities, but they never replied. Trying to reach the professional football league and its president, Frédéric Thierrys, was like coming up against a wall. Of course, he didn't understand our request, he didn't care. But why? We weren't asking for the moon. The 5th of May is one day a year. We've seen how easy it is to move a match because of the weather or something else. But this perceived attitude of indifference from football authorities toward the deadliest sports catastrophe in France led the group to look for other means of action. Michel Castellani was in charge of drafting a law prohibiting professional matches from taking place on the 5th of May that was met with a series of hurdles. French football authorities were very wary of politicians getting involved. There was a resistance from football authorities. We had to get past it. It was hard because there was pressure, first on me, then on a considerable number of members of parliament to make sure we didn't vote in favor of this draft law.
The law was eventually adopted by an almost unanimous vote at the National Assembly in October of 2021. Thirty years of fighting and 30 years of hard work had finally paid off with a day of remembrance on the 5th of May. Voilà, ils se sont battus. Ils se sont battus pendant 30 ans et c'est un pays. Voilà. Et maintenant, il n'y a plus de match, le 5 mai. C'est un signe de respect. Annabelle Le Couf, Robaglio with Flori Castan and Thierry de Rue revisiting Furiani for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website. You'll find that at france24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.